إن الحمد لله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعود بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن نبينا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Inshallah, in today's class, we're going to uh, conclude uh, the Isra and Mi'raj, uh, that travel that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam underwent. Uh, one thing that is important for us to know is that when it comes to the Isra and Mi'raj, there's a lot of uh, things that have been added uh, by people, uh, weak hadith uh, that people attribute to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and some people have even taken the Isra and the Mi'raj to be uh, a sacred date in the sense that they celebrate uh, this date of Isra and Mi'raj. But all of that is not found in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He would never command his companions to celebrate uh, the Isra and Mi'raj. Uh, so we need to keep that in mind. Where we left off last week, um, it was where the Prophet وسلم, had met uh, the prophets in the heavens, and he, uh, the final prophet that he met was Ibrahim السلام, <coughs> And Ibrahim السلام, uh, one thing that I did not mention in last week's class was that uh, when he greeted the Prophet وسلم, uh, not only did he greet the Prophet وسلم, but uh, Ibrahim السلام, uh, told the Prophet وسلم, to pass on his salam to all the believers. To pass on his salam, the salam, the greeting of Ibrahim السلام, to all the believers uh, in the uh, Ummah. Uh, so this is uh, one of those occasions where Ibrahim السلام, is actually giving Greetings to each and every Muslim. So, uh, for that we say, Alayhi wa ala nabiyyina afdal salatu wa salam. So, we respond by uh, giving the uh, greetings and peace and blessings, and we make dua for both uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, another thing that Ibrahim السلام, told the Prophet وسلم, was he told him about Jannah. Okay. And one of the specific things that he said was, he said, give glad tidings to your Ummah about Jannah. And tell them that Jannah, the, uh, the soil, the earth of Jannah is fertile, it is uh, a place where uh, a lot of things can grow. It's been made clear for things to grow. And he said the way that a believer uh, plants trees in Jannah is by saying SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. By saying these at kam, this dhikr, every time you say that, there's a tree that is planted for you in Jannah. So Ibrahim السلام, is giving advice to the believers that increase in this dhikr. Uh, make sure that you uh, keep saying it. The more you say, the more you are actually planting in Jannah for yourself in the future. So this was some of the advice that Ibrahim السلام, gave the Prophet And then we said that the Prophet وسلم, uh, kept on moving and he reached that level where Jibreel السلام, said to the Prophet وسلم, this is my limit, I can't go beyond this limit and in some narrations if I go beyond this limit I will burn up. So the Prophet وسلم, proceeded um, and he reached uh, the place where uh, a, a tree that is known as Sidratul Muntaha, uh, the tree that is at the outmost level and this tree the Prophet وسلم, he said the leaves of this tree is like the ears of uh, 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 elephants. The ears of elephants. It is a very huge tree 
and uh, not only that, but the Prophet وسلم, he said that this tree, he said, I can't even uh, start or begin to uh, describe for you how beautiful, how magnificent, how great and big this tree was. So the Prophet وسلم, is telling us that this tree was a special creation by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is at the utmost level uh, in terms of the creation, it is the boundary, and that is where the Prophet وسلم, uh, in some narrations, he received uh, the prayers. He received the prayers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is important. Why? Because the scholars in Islam, they say every uh, other form of uh, prayer or, or worship, rather, um, it was revealed through Jibreel السلام, It came down through the Wahi and the Prophet وسلم, was told to give zakat. The Prophet وسلم, was told to fast in the month of Ramadan and so on. But Salah, the scholars in Islam, they say, is unique. And it is the pinnacle, it is the highest level of the religion. Uh, some scholars have gone to the extent to say that a person's share Islam, his share in Islam is directly proportionate to his salah. Meaning that if a person prays his salah, the five daily prayers, then he has a good position in Islam, meaning that he is a good Muslim. But if he misses prayers, then uh, this is proportionate to how good he is uh, uh, in Islam. This shows us that Islam uh, Salah and Islam go hand in hand. Uh, some scholars in Islam, they've said, and most of them have agreed upon this fact, saying that whoever leaves prayer, whoever leaves praying Salah, that person is a disbeliever. That person is a disbeliever. Uh, where the scholars have deferred and they debate on is if a person misses one Salah, because of them being busy or you know some other reasons, then some scholars have said this person is uh, a disbeliever, other saying that this is from the major sins. But what the majority have agreed upon is if a person is told to pray and the person says, I don't need salah or I don't want to pray, then this person, uh, according to the Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, that person is no longer a Muslim. So this is a very, very important point. Uh, so when the Prophet ﷺ first received the prayer, he was uh, told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the prayer were 50 prayers uh, a day. 50 prayers a day. And then on the way back, the Prophet ﷺ, as most of us know, he went by Musa ﷺ. And Musa السلام, when he heard about that, he told the Prophet وسلم, that <coughs> uh, the Bani Israel, the people of Musa السلام, they were stronger and had more energy than uh, our people, meaning the people of the Prophet وسلم, uh, and this Ummah, and he said they were not able to do it. They were not able to do it. So he said to the Prophet وسلم, go back to your Lord, go back to your Lord and ask him to reduce it. And the Prophet وسلم, he kept doing that until he reached five prayers a day. And even at five prayers a day, Musa وسلم, told uh, the Prophet وسلم, that your people will not be able to do it. Go back and ask your Lord. And um, uh, at that moment, the Prophet وسلم, said, I feel shy, I can't go back to my Lord. And the five prayers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet وسلم, that these prayers are five, but they are equal to 50 in reward. They are equal to 50 in reward. <coughs> Some people that uh, have little understanding they say, uh, you know, yeah, late, if only the Prophet وسلم, had gone back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, got it reduced from five until, uh, you know, three or a few prayers. But 
prayer in reality is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is uh, to uh, you know, help human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never makes things difficult for people. When Allah has set down uh, five daily prayers, it is not to burden people, but it is for their own benefit. <clears throat> so the Prophet وسلم, when he made his way back uh, to this world, uh, some scholars, they say on his way back, he passed um, uh, Bayt al-Maqdis and then went back to uh, Mecca. And when he came to Mecca, <coughs> he arrived in Mecca uh, before Fajr prayer, before Fajr prayer. And the next morning, uh, the mushrikeen, they started asking the Prophet وسلم, what happened last night. And lo and behold, the person that was asking that question was no other than Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl was this person that was on top of the Prophet وسلم, all the time trying to make it as difficult for the Prophet as possible. So the Prophet وسلم, told him, he said, last night I traveled to Bayt al-Maqdis and then I went to the heavens and then I came back. And then when Abu Jahl heard that, he thought to himself, I found my, my way to, to disgrace and make people disbelieve in the Prophet So he started calling people, uh, the Quraysh and those who believed in the Prophet and so on. And he said, tell them what you told me, what happened last night. And the Prophet didn't have any problems with it. And he told them again, he said the same thing. And uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and the believers, they believed in the Prophet without any problems. And that is when Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said that famous statement, he said, why should I not believe in the Prophet when he's telling me that he traveled from uh, Mecca to Bayt al-Maqdis and to the heavens and coming back, when I believe in him when he's telling me about things that will happen after death. I believe in him when he tells me there's a now and there's a Jannah and there's Qiyamah and there's Hisan and so on. I believe in him in that. This thing that you're telling him about, telling me about is a minor thing. I believe in this. But the Quraysh, they kept making fun of the Prophet وسلم, and they said to him, you know, O Muhammad وسلم, that we travel to Bayt al Maqdis a month and then we travel back a month. And you're telling us you did all this in one night? And, and then they said to the Prophet uh, if you're telling us the truth, if you're truthful in your statement, describe for us Bayt al Maqdis. Describe for us uh, the, the scenery and the masjid and everything that is there. And this was something difficult for the Prophet Why was it difficult? If I ask you now, if I tell you, most of us, we've been to uh, University of Victoria, right? We've been there more than once. If someone comes to you and asks you and says, are you really from uh, Victoria, the city of Victoria? If you are, or if, if you've ever been to the city of Victoria, tell me how the university looks like. Describe for me. Where is this campus? Where is this building? Most people, they won't be able to, to tell you detail, this building is there, this building is there. Even though you know it, even though you've been there. Meaning that you don't always pay attention to your surroundings. So this was the case of the Prophet Sallallahu he had never been there before, and then now he was asked to be uh, to describe this place in detail. So, as a mu'jiza, as a miracle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he did was, he brought, uh, in some narrations, Jibreel alayhi salam brought to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this whole area in front of him in a way that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could see it. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, I looked at the direction of Dar uh, al uh, Arqam, that building that the Muslims used to uh, uh, hide in. And he said, When I looked at that direction, I saw the whole image of what they were asking me in front of my vision. Now, today, 
that doesn't seem that very uh, impossible. A hundred years ago, when people were reading those type of hadith, you know, there's a lot of iman involved. Because this is the uh, unseen, the Prophet is telling us. Now, today, we have Google Glass and we have this and that, and you look at the direction, people they think that you're looking at uh, one particular building, but in reality, you might be looking at a completely different image. And this is just a small po portion of the no uh, knowledge and the technology that we have today. So the Prophet is telling us that he was not only able to see this image in front of him, but he said uh, he was able to describe for them uh, that place door by door, uh, street by street, and everything that they asked him about, the Prophet ﷺ was able to respond to them 110%. And when they knew that they couldn't find anything on the Prophet ﷺ in terms of the description of the place, uh, they said to him, you have told us how it looks like. You have not increased or decreased. You have told us exactly the way it looks. And then the Prophet ﷺ told them, he said, rather I tell you something even more than that. Something that you won't be able to deny. And they said, what is that? And the Prophet ﷺ said, tomorrow there will be a caravan. You know, camels traveling, doing business, and so on. He said, tomorrow there will be a caravan that comes to Mecca. And he said, in that caravan you will find this and that and so on. And you will find, he said in some narrations, you will find a camel that has its legs, has a problems with, uh, with its legs. And then the next day, the next day came, and then the mushrikeen, they were waiting for the caravan, and the caravan came, and they found everything except that camel that the Prophet ﷺ had told them about. So they asked the people, they said, where is this camel? There's supposed to be a camel that has a problem with, it, with its leg. The people were shocked. They said, how do you know about this camel? He said, no, no, don't worry about that. Tell us what happened to the camel. Why is the camel not here? And then they said, well, on the way, the camel had a problem with, it, with its leg, and it couldn't uh, uh, complete the journey, so we had to dispose of it. We had to get rid of the camel. So subhanAllah, even then, when the Prophet sallam, had been truthful in every single thing, describing how the area looked like and went beyond that and told them that there would be this caravan coming and described it in detail, even then the kuffar of Quraysh, they did not believe. And this is just one example that shows us that true hidayah, true guidance uh, belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, how many evidences or how many uh, miracles a person has shown is that if the person does not want to believe, he will always find a reason not to believe or he will make up a reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that even if he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was to send, send down angels to them, and if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa kallamahumul mawta and even if the dead, the people that have passed away were to talk to them ma kanu liyuminu they would have not believed illa an yasha Allah except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have willed for them to believe and this means that if a person lives a righteous life if a person uh, you know helps people does the things that are needed from the person and you know strives and tries their best to be guided and asks Allah for guidance Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust 
And inshallah, with that we will we have concluded uh, the authentic narrations concerning the Isra and the Mi'raj. Um, and inshallah, in the uh, coming uh, few classes, we will carry on. Uh, we com we come in close to the part where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, is given permission by Allah azza wa jal to uh, do the hijrah from uh, Mecca to Medina. Because up until that moment in time, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a prophet, he is not allowed to do things the way that he wants it. Every single thing that he gets is by guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So up until that moment in time, the Prophet is not, hasn't been given the permission to leave Mecca uh, to go to Medina. And then later on, we will see that that permission is given to the Prophet and most of the companions they leave and the Prophet is actually one of the uh, last remaining people that leave Mecca. Uh, there's still some uh, companions that are left behind in Mecca later on. Um, they can't do the hijrah the same way that the others did. But inshallah, uh, we will carry on with the story. Uh, we'll conclude here for today. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please, uh, now is the time to ask. <coughs> There are some, Zakallah uh, and the brother is asking about the conversation uh, between uh, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at this place, Sidratul Muntaha. Um, there are some narrations that tell us that there was a conversation and that conversation is uh, found in the uh, tahiyat uh, in the Salah, At-Tahiyyat al-Illahi al barakatuh and so on. And that, that uh, shows us the conversation between uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Jibreel alayhi salam later on hears this conversation and he adds uh, peace and blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, but to my knowledge, uh, all of those narrations are weak at the best. They're weak at the best. Um, it does not mean that uh, you know they are fabricated or made up or anything like that. Uh, but there are scholars that have spoken about uh, the authenticity of those things. So because of that, we try to uh, leave it off and just mention what has been uh, reported 100% uh, without a doubt in both Sahih Muslim and Sahih uh, uh, Bukhari. I hope that uh, answers the question. Yes. Yes. Yeah, um, there's uh, the hadith are found. Um, one of the best ones are the narrations uh, by uh, um, uh, Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu uh, in the hadith that is found in Sahih Muslim, uh, where uh, the Prophet وسلم, is telling them about the details. Uh, you know, describing Bayt al Maqdis to these people. Um, so it is mentioned in the hadith. I don't have the hadith right now, but it is something that is definitely found. Yes? Uh, when you said that the previous question about the conversation, and you said some ulama said, had an objection. Yes. Uh, one question is what qualifies as something authentic? I'm not sure if I'm right, but would there be cases case that there will always be someone who said there is something wrong with it? And can we disqualify that as this one of objection? Or what is the ruling on it? What is the ruling on it? What is the criteria? That's a very good question. Uh, what qualifies a hadith to be uh, acceptable and what uh, if, let's say, uh, you know, majority of scholars have uh, accepted one hadith and you have a few scholars that don't accept a certain hadith. This uh, is actually um, a whole science, a whole field uh, in itself, uh, uh, the field of uh, hadith and its terminology and 
when you know when a hadith is considered to be authentic and weak, uh, this is something that people study study for a very very long time. Uh, Imam Al Bukhari, rahimahullah Taala, is one of the m uh, most well known scholars in that particular field, and he spent his whole life uh, seeking and learning about this. Um, it is difficult to uh, say that if you find this and that in a hadith, then you know the hadith is uh, considered to be uh, authentic. Uh, but as a general rule. Uh, yes, this knowledge has been codified by scholars um, and for laymen like us, people that have not studied the science in detail, uh, the simple thing is we say whatever uh, Imam uh, Muslim and Imam al-Bukhari have agreed upon, if you find a hadith that says that these two scholars have agreed upon this hadith, then the majority, if not all, of the Muslim Ummah, they've all agreed that this particular hadith is considered to be uh, authentic. And then everything else that comes after that, uh, hadiths that have been narrated by other scholars, uh, collected by other scholars, uh, you know, there's a degree uh, that it, it takes, it, that degree keeps going down and down and down until uh, you reach a level where uh, you know you can scholars they say you can't use uh, weak hadith to justify uh, a particular form of worship. Okay, uh, but when it comes to stories in the uh, you know things that tells us about what happened and so on, that is fine. Uh, so just to bring it all together, there are. Science, this is a science, it has been codified, there are conditions, uh, but those conditions are not as straightforward as just saying that every time you find this in a particular hadith, then this hadith is always 110%. And for us, as uh, normal Muslims, people who haven't studied Islam in great depth, what is the best, the best way to approach it is to look at the Imams before us, Imams that the Muslim Ummah have agreed upon, like you know, Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, and these scholars. If these hadiths have been agreed upon by the majority of the major scholars of hadith, then there's no, nothing wrong with uh, acting upon it and believing in it. I hope that answers it a little bit. This is one of the moments where the Arab towards the Quran. In Islam and Mi'raj, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opposed time in Israel and Mi'raj. Um, to my knowledge, uh, there's nothing that shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opposed uh, uh, the time um, during Israel and Mi'raj. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did all these things. Uh, from the time of Isha until Fajr, um, but that does not necessarily mean that the time was paused. However, uh, you know it, it could mean that uh, the the way the time um, is uh, the, the way time passes in different places might be different. So you might be in one place and time seems to stand still, but in reality it doesn't stand still. So that's a completely different thing. But however, one important thing uh, that made me, you made me remember is that there's actually another uh, prophet um, uh, of the Bani Israel, uh, the only time where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually made time stand still. He made time stand still for this prophet in order for them to be victorious in a battle. Um, the sun was about to set, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped, stopped time and the time was uh, increased and they were able to become victorious in that battle. Um, so that's the only time that I can remember that is authentically mentioned. Yes. Yes. Why did Yeah, exactly. That's a very good point. Uh, the brother is asking about the hikmah, the wisdom, why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, 
he was instructed by Musa Islam to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then you know why did not why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not give the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the five prayers and you know that would have been the end of it. The scholars in Islam they say uh, the best answer to this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to show his favor upon uh, the believers. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have given five prayers to the Muslim Ummah at uh, one time and there wouldn't have been this dialogue, you would not have appreciated as much. But the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us that he does not want to burden people that every time that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala never said no. Every single time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went back, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala made it easy for people. So this shows that Allah Azza wa Jal wants to make things easy for people and does not want to make it difficult for people. And this is one of the ways that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala shows His favor upon mankind. So this is the best answer. Um, nothing that can come that comes to mind right now, um, but I'm sure that this is not the only time where uh, you know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has shown His uh, uh, mercy and His rahma uh, to mankind, making things easy for people. Yes. The Prophet Sallallahu perhaps we can mention that in the upcoming classes, there are certain narrations that tell, uh, tell us about the things that the Prophet Sallallahu saw uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, blessings and uh, uh, punishments for certain people and so on. Inshallah, uh, next time we will try to mention that as well. Um, so, uh, one final point that I wanted to mention, this is uh, important, is that uh, the scholars in Islam, they differ on the issue of whether the Prophet ﷺ actually saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during Isra al Mi'raj, meaning he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his own eyes. Um, and the, perhaps the opinion that is closest to the truth is that, Allah, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ did not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his own eyes. Um, this is backed up by the uh, Quran and even certain hadith the Prophet وسلم, said when he was asked, Did you see your Lord? He said, uh, uh, You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if I saw light, and how can I perceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, being that light? Uh, some scholars they say so the Prophet وسلم, saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his heart. Uh, and not with his eye, because it is physically impossible uh, to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this uh, lifetime. Uh, people will see, the believers will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Akhirah when they enter Jannah. Uh, but, uh, so the correct opinion in this particular issue is that we say the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not see uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, with his own eyes in the way that people will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Akhirah and the hereafter. So inshallah, yes? Okay. What was the incident of Musa on Mount Sinai? That's a good point. This links to the question here uh, that I was talking about. Musa alayhi salam, he said to Allah, I want to see you. This is what has been mentioned in the Quran that Musa alayhi salam said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Allah, let me see you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied to Musa alayhi salam, Lan ta'ani, you, you won't be able to see me. And uh, uh, Musa alayhi salam still persisted and he wanted to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Allah azza wa jal told Musa alayhi salam, look at that uh, tree or that bush, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, appeared to Musa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam could not uh, handle it. It was not something that human beings are meant to be able to handle in this world. Uh, and Allah azza wa jal says in the Quran uh, that Musa alayhi salam fell, fell down unconscious and he was not able to see and that's when Musa alayhi salam realized that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling him was uh, the absolute truth in the sense that in this world people can't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
so this backs it up, it uh, provides more evidence for the fact that the Prophet وسلم, did not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is a blessing that is reserved for the believers on the day uh, of judgment. So inshallah with that we will conclude with Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa